Hello, um, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so very much for clicking on this video um, and choosing to learn more about the Adelos Muertos uh, with me, together with me. My name is Alicia Lopez. I am a professor in sociology at Mira Costa College. I also teach Chicana and Chicano studies. And I am thrilled to be able to talk to you about this topic that's near and dear to me. Um, although I did not grow up uh, practicing Dia de los Muertos, and it was not something that was a traditional um, ritual within my family, in recent years, perhaps uh, four or five years back, I've begun to learn more about the tradition, the history, um, how to set up the altar, how, you know, what the, the, the meaning of the items that are placed in the altar are, uh, etc. And I think that, um, you know, my interest in learning more about Dia de los Muertos um, stems largely from um, losses that I've experienced in my family. Um, you know, as a, as a young uh, child, you know, we don't experience the loss of tias and tios um, until we're much older. And so for me, uh, it was important that, that I honor them um, and remember them and um, learn how to remain in connection with my ancestors, with my tias and tios. And so I think that's, that's part of my interest in and yeah, those moments. I am also very much, um, as a sociologist and um, an ethnic studies professor, Chicana Chicana studies professor, I'm very much interested in culture, um, cultural ethnic identity, and the ways in which um, having a, a strong, um, solid understanding and connection to one's cultura um, can be a source, source of empowerment um, and healing. Um, and restorative. So uh, that is another reason why I, I am very interested in this topic. All right. Um, with that said, I, you know, although I am Chicana, I do identify as Chicana. Um, as I said, I did not practi practice um, uh, the Dia de los Muertos throughout my lifetime until recent years. Um, and I do teach Chicana and Chicano studies. That doesn't make me an expert. I am here to share with you what I've learned. Um, and hope that it's useful to you. I'm also here to learn from you, so please, uh, at the end of this uh, PowerPoint uh, slide, there is uh, my email, so feel free to contact me, reach out to me if you want to chat more about this, um, have questions, um, or want to teach me something. Um, I'd be happy, happy, happy to learn from you. So thank you um, um, ahead of time. Um, also, you know, as most of you might know, there are various interpretations and understandings about the origins of uh, Dia de los Muertos, the meanings of the offerings in the altar. Um, there's different um, ideas about Dia de los Muertos, whether it's more of a Spanish uh, ideology and tradition, or is it more pre-Hispanic, etc. Um, so I, I did my research. I'm this is, again, something that I'm going to continue to, to do. Um, but what I have here to share with you is it's what I understand from the various sources that I've uh, uh, researched. Um, and also, like, you know, what, what makes sense to me and what I feel um, is, is, uh, resonates most. So this video is meant to be an introduction to... Um, Dia de los Muertos, and um, I organized it in, in the following way. Um, so first, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, what is Dia de los Muertos in general. Um, what's the, what, are, what ideas are, are out there about the origin of this celebration in Mexico? Um, and we are talking about Mex Mexico specifically. Um, how it is celebrated? And then also why um, we should celebrate it, um, from my perspective. Dia de los Muertos, as we know it, and especially as we know it here in the United States, um, is a Mexican celebration. It's a Mexican um, tradition, uh, not a Latin American celebration or Latin American tradition. 
Um, with this, I'm not meaning to say that you know, in other countries of Latin America, people do not celebrate um, uh, their ancestors or um, honor their ancestors in a similar fashion. Um, but Dia de los Muertos, again, as we know it, as I'm speaking of today, is specifically a Mexican celebration. The celebration occurs, um, and there's going to be like minimal, but some variation in the dates, right? Um, it occurs between October 30th, 31st to November 3rd. Um, the, the main um, days are November 1st and 2nd. Um, when I say November, when I say October 30th um, through November uh, 3rd, I'm also including the days that um, people um, take to set up the altar, uh, which would be October 30th and 31st, um, and then the day that um, people uh, spend to take down the altar, which would be November 3rd. So it is, it is a celebration to honor our ancestors who have passed and gone to the spirit world um, before us. And in this way, we honor the cycle of life and death um, and celebrate our ancestors' lives and what they've left behind for us, the legacies. Um, so it's not a, a, a holiday or celebration of death but rather um, a celebration of the lives of our family members that have passed, our ancestors, and all that we've learned and um, inherited from them, their legacies. Um, exactly how people celebrate, it varies, it depends. Um, so some people will have full-on parties with music, lots of food, lots of people. Other folks will visit their local cemeteries um, and visit their loved ones there, place their altar at the cemetery. Um, other folks have migrated, they're not anywhere near um, their community's cemetery or the cemetery that um, their ancestors, their familias are buried in. So they might uh, place an altar at home. Um, some cities hold large parades and festivals. For example, Mexico City um, does this. In fact, this year it will uh, begin on October 30th. So depending on the region of Mexico, or the community in the state, even um, if you're in the south or in the north of Mexico, central Mexico, there's different ways that people celebrate. Um, it really depends on, you know, the local tradition. Um, and also we know that um, Dia de los Muertos has become a significant and, and very visible um, celebration in the United States as well. And um, as that has happened and, and Dia de los Muertos has appeared in our lives at, um, in the United States, um, we, we also incorporate different elements and features and different ways of celebrating it here. Uh, so there's a variety of ways uh, people celebrate. So um, in terms of the origin of Dia de Muertos in Mexico, there's debate. Um, and depending on your source, you will learn different facts and different um, ideas. Uh, so, you know, some, you know, will argue it's uh, more of a Spanish or Catholic uh, tradition and ideology um, that it is rooted in. And other folks will say that it's uh, more, uh, more uh, indigenous um, roots. So whether it is more European or indigenous, um, you know, I would say wh who knows um, exactly. Um, I have my own ideas, and I'll share that with you in a bit. Um, but there was a, another idea that I found very interesting in my research, um, which is that um, if, if you're in any way familiar with Mexican history, you'll know that um, post-Mexican Revolution, uh, Mexico, Mexico um, swung you know, uh, politically um, very much to the left, um, and it became a, a very nationalist uh, country. And 
part of that um, the nationalist um, post-revolution um, identity and politics, uh, identity politics that Mexico in, um, um, set forth uh, was this idea that Mexico was, uh, you know, unique, um, and even perhaps I would uh, go as far as to say that there was this sense of, uh, you know, this idea of Mexican superiority. Uh, because we were la raza cosmica, the cosmic race, right? We were a race uh, that uh, in, incorporated both uh, European and indigenous blood, right? Um, and so this was the indigenista movement. Um, and the, the article talked about how post-Mexican Revolution Mexico um, is part of its nationalist agenda uh, was to uh, construct a Mexican identity that was mestizo, that was, you know, based on this idea of raza cosmica, that was very much indigenous, that it had indigenous roots. And um, so uh, what the Mexican government did and some of the uh, Mexican intellectuals was argue that and, and re-envision and re uh, imagine Dia de los Muertos in a way in which um, the idea was that it was rooted in, in pre-Hispanic indigenous um, cultura, right? So there was that um, argument idea as well, which I found very interesting. And it makes, a very, uh, it makes sense to me, um, having studied Mexican history, that this, this would be uh, a strategy, a political strategy um, and rhetoric that Mexico would put forth, right? Um, again, who knows exactly what I would, though what I could um, almost assure is that Dia de los Muertos is in fact a combination of both as a manifestation of synchronism through conquest and colonization, which is um, the experience uh, in Mexico as well as in the United States. Um, you have efforts to subdue and erase uh, the, the population that's being conquered by the conqueror, right? And in this case, it's um, Spain and Catholic Spain. So um, in their conquest and process of colonization, uh, there is an effort to erase the belief system, the, the religion, languages, uh, institutions, everything um, of the, that existed in Mesoamerica. Um, and then you have also resistance. Um, the native indigenous population of what is now Mexico did not sit back and take this um, without resistance. So um, whether it was practicing their religion and their um, the prayer in, uh, in hiding or combining um, parts of Catholicism with their own beliefs and religious practices, um, there was resistance. So with conquest and colonization, there is uh, inevitably um, an amalgamation of different religions, different cultures, languages that come together and merge. Um, and there's also a transculturation, adoption uh, by by uh, native people or even Spanish uh, people, the cultural forms of the other, um, um, or even you know partially replacing some of their own cultural forms with uh, adoptions of either Spanish or um, indigenous um, practices. So uh, that is my um, what I'm leaning towards, right? That this is uh, and what most people would would argue is that Dia de los Muertos is a, is a synchronism, um, much like, for example, uh, the Virgen de Guadalupe, right, which only exists in Mexico, because again, this is uh, uh, an example of uh, the synchronism that, that results from conquest and colonization. There is, uh, you know, in the end, though, um, there is one one passage that I, I would like to share with you that I came upon came across 
that I think is powerful. Um, and I think I, I share this perspective, right? So in the end, what's most important um, is what the director of uh, INA, the Instituto, Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia, and he said, um, um, and I'll say it in Spanish and I'll try to translate it, um, que el afirmar que el origen de Día de Muertos sea prehispánico o europeo es cuestión de enfoques. So to assert that, you know, Día de los Muertos is either European or more European or it's pre-Hispanic indigenous um, is really a matter of um, focus or emphasis, right? So I think, again, the ambiguity of the origin of Día de los Muertos allows for people to reimagine, reinterpret, and recreate this um, tradition um, in a way that that is uh, most empowering and, and meaningful to them, right? Uh, for me, as a Chicana, um, you know, I, you know, I, I had to, when I read this passage, I had to ask myself, well, where, where, where am I leaning? What, what direction am I leaning towards? Uh, or what is my focus, right? Um, and, and for me, it's, it's a desire to better understand um, my indigenous roots. Um, I am not indigenous. I don't claim that identity. I am Chicana. I am Mestiza. Uh, um, but I do have those roots as someone from this land, right, from the Americas. Um, and so just trying to understand that better um, uh, with the intent of, uh, you know, resisting um complete resisting um, assimilation into a dominant culture uh, which is white American um, or um, you know even Spanish European Spanish um, um, ideologies and practices uh, through learning about uh, indigenous pre-hispanic traditions uh, as a way to decolonize right um, and empower and self-empowerment uh, in my research um, for this project, but also in my experience teaching Chicana and Chicano studies um, and reading on uh, Mesoamerican history and cultura, uh, I found that many of the elements and practices and beliefs around Dia de los Muertos uh, was very much present in, um, in Mesoamerica um, and their own beliefs and practices around death and mourning um, and then festivals uh, honoring the dead um, and changes in seasons and agricultural cycles. Uh, there was various festivals that were mentioned um, in which, um, you know, it was the central uh, theme was honoring gods or honoring uh, the dead, dead warriors, um, ancestors, um, moments where, uh, or celebrations where it included uh, uh, making offerings to um, the dead. Uh, so uh, I thought it was very interesting, um, which again, this is another reason why um, I, I feel um, um, the idea that Dia de los Muertos is rooted in indigenous um, Mesoamerican ideologies and practices and rituals and festivals is true um, because I see that thread. I think one of the, um, the ideas um, that I found most interesting and uh, linked to Dia de los Muertos um, was the idea of a journey. So the, the dead, the spirit of the dead, um, having to take on a journey um, either to the underworld or one of the 13 heavens that existed. Um, and in the case of the Aros Muertos, back, right? Or even in the case of Mesoamerican uh, festivals and celebrations, when they're, uh, when they honored the dead, their ancestors, the idea that they were, will return 
Um, I thought that was very interesting, um, the levels of altar, right? Um, there was nine levels that uh, the dead had to travel and um, journey across to finally get to Mictlan, which is um, their final resting place, right? So this idea of, of journeying uh, back, journeying to the underworld, or journeying um, from the underworld, from the spirit world back, is a theme that um, I saw in, in my research. Some of the uh, festivals um, that were mentioned in the readings that I that I looked at, um, or these here, for example, um, that I'm not going to try to pronounce because I do not know how to speak Nahuatl. And, um, uh, it's, it's too difficult for me, but um, uh, Kicholi, uh, and then there's this other one, um, um, and then there's these, this uh, last one. Um, you can type it in and, and take a look at it and do some more research. I can't pronounce it, sorry. Um, but those are some examples of the rites and festivals that um, were very similar to, to what is now the Ada los Muertos. So I'm still on the topic of the origin of the Ada los Muertos, right? In Mexico, where, where is it more Mesoamerican? Is it more Spanish? Um, what is it exactly? And again, it's it's a mix of both. Um, and I would say that it's perhaps even more of a Mesoamerican um, tradition, um, based on what I've learned for this research. Um, so here are some other examples of, of things that I, the way that I sorted out was like things that I, I felt were more Mesoamerican um, and then the, the practices in the current day Dia de los Muertos that I feel are more Spanish. So one obvious one is um, the dates, right? So November 1st and 2nd, um, there's almost no doubt or I would, I would say no doubt that that is, um, those are dates that align with the Catholic celebrations of All Saints or All Souls Day, Todos Santos y Fieles Difuntos. And so that is very much um, a Spanish tradition and a result of colonization. Um, one of the festivals, uh, which is written right here, um, that was uh, celebrated um, and that is often um, correlated with the Adelos Muertos was not celebrated in November. It was celebrated um, somewhere between July 24th and August 12th. Um, so there's a difference there. Um, another another example that, that we see today in the de los Muertos that's also Spanish is a symbol of the cross, right? And that's pretty obvious, crucifix. That is something that um, is not um, uh, Mesoamerican. Some things that I found that were, um, you know, a Mesoamerican tradition um, that we now incorporate into the altar are, for example, the dogs. So there's a tradition of, and you'll see some pictures um, um, soon, of the, the dog um, that we place in the altar, which is symbolizes uh, Xolosquintle or the chichi, right? Which is, that's the Nahuatl word uh, for it. And so uh, the dog is meant to a uh, uh, a company, um, the person, uh, our ancestors, um, back or to Mictlan, right? So in the past, when um, someone uh, passed in, for example, Aztec society, um, the, there was a, a titi or a solo uh, squintle, a dog, uh, that was uh, sacrificed and buried with this deceased so that it would accompany um, them into the underworld and help them especially cross a river that they needed to cross to get even to the first of the nine um, levels that led to the underworld, to their final resting place. Um, and so, so, you know, when I began to, to learn how to put together my altar, um, I came to Tijuana, um, to Mercado Hidalgo to buy the items to 
put the altar together and I was t I saw these black dogs, uh, figurines um, everywhere and I asked and, and I was told that it symbolized the, the dog that would um, guide uh, the dead. So that's obviously a Mesoamerican um, belief um, and practice. Offerings was also something that I saw in when I read Mesoamerican history around death um, and honoring the dead. Skulls, obviously, um, you know, if you remember the skull rack, uh, it, it was something that 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 we still uh, use today, right? The image of the skull, or the calavera. So again, the origin it's uh, it's largely a product of synchronous. Um, results that come from the conquest and colonization of Spain, of, I'm sorry, what is now Mexico, uh, by Spain. Um, and also, it, you know, cultura is, is not something that's static, it's dynamic, and it uh, reinvents itself every single day. We add different elements to our exist existing culture, um, and it evolves, right? So we incorporate different customs um, to what is now Dia de los Muertos, especially um, as the United States has become, for example, um, a country that that is the home to um, so many uh, Mexicans, right? Mexicanos. Um, we will bring uh, the tradition to um, uh, the country and also be curious to learn about the traditions that exist in Mexico even when we are born and raised in the United States such as myself right um, and we will um, reinvent the other los muertos and add things that make sense to us um, so uh, you know that is that is the case with the celebration what is true though um, is that Dia de los Muertos has become like uh, one of the most important national festivals or celebrations in Mexico, um, besides Mexican Independence Day or even uh, Dia de la Virgen de Guadalupe. It, it's a national symbol. It um, it's a symbol of uh, Mexican identity and cultura, and so it's it has become a uh, an important um, celebration in the country. And as we see in the United States, it's, it's um, more and more becoming uh, a very visible and uh, meaningful uh, celebration uh, to people in the United States as well, um, especially uh, Mexican Americans, Chicanos. The United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization declared in the uh, intangible heritage of humanity um, that the indigenous festivals dedicated to the dead are a uh, syncretic um, festival between pre-Hispanic culture and the Catholic uh, religion. Uh, and that the multicultural, multi-ethnic nature of Mexico has given rise to expressions of diverse folklore uh, transmitted from generation to generation, uh, and which over time uh, gives different meanings um, and evocations uh, that have been added to the other little Marcos. So, wanted to end um, this um, platica on the origin of the other little Marcos with that. I want to talk a little bit about um, how do we celebrate, how is um, the other little Marcos celebrated. Um, especially like what are the different elements that it includes, like what, how do we set up the altar, um, and so um, rituals and beliefs and traditions around death are cultural universals, meaning that every single um, culture has their own beliefs, belief systems and rituals and practices around dead, the dead or death, right? Um, so that's universal. Um, but I, I think that uh, those beliefs and practices say a lot about the, the, the culture and the, the cultural and ethnic identity of the people and their worldview and their uh, experience, life experience. So it's worth examining the specificities of 
uh, these, you know, beliefs, rituals, traditions within the context of Dia de los Muertos in Mexico um, and its interconnection with Mexican culture and identity. Um, so I encourage you to, you know, if you use this video as a jumping off point and, and continue to do that research and learning outside of this. Um, you know, for the altar, typically you have three um, levels, if not more. Um, you know, again, I, you know, I, I, I find it very interesting, um, you know, the setup of the altar with the three or more levels and then also the, the, the belief um, and the idea in Mesoamerican, uh, especially post-classic Mesoamerican culturas uh, about the journey down to Mictlan, um, the underworld, and how the dead had to tra traverse um, at least nine, well, actually nine levels, right, to finally rest in peace. Um, and so that, I thought that was interesting. Um, also in the altar, you have, uh, you know, there's a, the practice of including the four elements, earth, water, fire, and air. Um, earth, um, obviously the floor. Um, traditionally, and you'll see this in this um, picture here, uh, which is a photograph that I took in Mercado Hidalgo in uh, Tijuana. I encourage you to visit Mercado Hidalgo during um, the festivities of Dia de los Muertos. Um, they put together altares, and it's a very lively um, space during that time. So on the floor, you see a petate. Petate is actually a Nahuatl word, and it's uh, what um, the Aztecs used to sleep on, right? So this was their bed. Um, and so traditionally, you place a petate um, as your first level of your altar. So that's earth, right? Water, uh, traditionally, you place a glass of water in the altar, that's to quench the thirst um, of our ancestors, our family members that are deceased that come back to visit on November 1st and 2nd. So upon their arrival, they have the petate to lay down and rest. That's the idea, that they come, they arrive, they're tired, they lay down and rest. And that's what the petate is for. The water to drink um, because it's been a long journey back, right? So again, um, that's the connection that I see with Mesoamerican cultura. It's about a journey. So journey, journeying nine levels down to Mictlan and then journeying back is hard. So um, you want some somewhere where they can rest and you want to give them water. Fire, um, fire is also something that it was uh, important in um, Mesoamerican cultura when there was uh, someone that was deceased or, or, or uh, that died, that passed, um, they um, burned fire. I don't, I don't know exactly how um, because I don't believe there was um, candles. I got to do that added research. Um, but I know that they used fire, right? And so that's something that, that we continue to use uh, today, candles and veladoras. Um, and the fire is, again, to light their, their way back to so that they can find the altar in the home. Um, and also to connect um, the living with the spirit world. Uh, and then you have air, which is symbolized by the papel picado. Um, and so you see the, the colorful paper, it has the designs, and that is that is to symbolize air. So you have the four elements. Um, and then you have, of course, the ofrendas, the offerings, right? Which could be, you know, it's going to be food, it's going to be toys, it's going to be the, the favorite uh, things of your um, ancestors that you're honoring and celebrating in the altar. Um, also, you know, in, in Aztec society, Mesoamerican society, uh, music was very important. Uh, dance, danza, um, uh, literature. So there was uh, cala, um, calaveras literarias. So it's a tradition in Mexico to also write poetry during these um, 
festivities of Dia de los Muertos. So, um, Calaveras Literarias is uh, poetry that's written for these um, fechas, these dates, um, the, the eve of uh, Dia de los Muertos. So, um, right as you enter November 1st, you offer these um, calaveritas literarias to a loved one or someone else you share with other people. And oftentimes they're funny. Um, so, which is also, again, very, uh, as I said here above, right, that even though death um, is a cultural universal, um, the ritual beliefs and traditions around death are cultural universals, the ways in which people um, um, process death or view death um, is very telling of the cultura, right? So in Mexico, there's a, there's a, we have a really good sense of humor um, to the point where sometimes we're laughing about things that are probably not that funny or we shouldn't be laughing about, right? But um, humor is very important in this um, these dates, right? So now, uh, next I want to talk about significant elements and symbolisms um, related to Dia de los Muertos, um, particularly the altar. So I talked about skulls, uh, calaveras earlier, um, and how I feel that the origin of this symbol and um, its prominence in Mexican cultura, uh, especially around Dia de los Muertos, is rooted in Mesoamerica. This is an example. Um, Copal um, is also Mesoamerican. It's, uh, it's uh, native to Mesoamerica, and it was used widely in rituals. Um, in the Aztec Empire, for example, and I'm sure other uh, Mesoamerican cultures, the Xolosquinkle, the dog, um, I mentioned earlier how uh, when someone passed, uh, they were buried with a dog that was sacrificed. There was mentioning of the dog being yellow um, in one of my sources, and so that's why I <laughs> included a yellow Xolosquinkle here. So um, we'll talk more about that real quick. Here is a photograph of um, one of the altares that um, I put together with my family members in Tijuana. And you can see a lot of the elements that I'll be talking about here in the altar. You know, the, Simpas, uh, the flowers, Simpa Suchil, um, the photographs of our disease. Here is uh, the little black dog that I mentioned earlier. Um, Roots. Um, there's the sugar skull here, uh, papel picado, etc. So, um, in this slide is titled "Significant Elements and Symbolism." I have about three of these. You can pause the video and take a look at these um, uh, closely, more closely. Um, I will um, kind of like uh, go through these uh, as quick as I can because I've talked about some of this already. So Mesoamerican, um, rooted in Mesoamerican, I would say again, the Sholo or the Chichi uh, for guidance, which is the, the dog, um, the skull, water, um, fire, uh, Spanish rooted, the dates, I talked about that. Um, one thing that I found interesting was uh, that it's, that's down here, um, is that today, nowadays, um, we use photographs of our family members uh, to place it on the altar. Um, in the past, um, I know that in um, Aztec society, when someone passed and there was, they had four days of mourning the body, um, they used uh, effigies uh, in representation of the person that passed. So, um, that was interesting. Um, there was no photographs uh, back then, but there was still the intent to um, place something in the space that represented um, that person. So I thought that was pretty cool. And I also, again, interpreted, interpreted that as um, the idea of photographs um, on the altar rooted in Mesoamerican cultura. Perhaps one of the most um, prominent symbols of Dia de los Muertos is the yellow flower, Cempasuchi. Um, and this is a native flower to Mexico. 
Um, and I'm sure it's been used for, you know, historically, perhaps uh, even in Mesoamerican times. <clears throat> um, so the, the purpose of this flower is to facilitate the return of um, our family members and antepasados uh, to back to back home uh, because of the color um, that is so bright. Uh, but also the scent, the, the smell of the flowers is a strong scent. Um, so that's supposed to draw um, our ancestors back back home. Um, food, Mesoamerican hot chocolate, right? Tamales, Mesoamerican. These are traditional foods that we place in the altar. Uh, copal, talked about that. It's used to purify the energy in the space. Um, and then also, um, even though papel picado did not exist the way that we know it now did not exist in mesoamerican cultura um in society they did use paper and it's called amatl right and it it represents the element of air and um when a body was going to be buried versus um incinerated um first they covered the body with paper amatl and water right um and i thought that was interesting too and so i, I kind of Placed it in that category. Um, uh, food, I'm assuming pan de muerto is a Spanish tradition. Um, mole, café, fruit, which represents the autumn harvest. Um, so it's the fruits that are available during that time period. And we place that um, for our uh, ancestors that are returning for them to eat um, upon their return. We put, we put that in the uh, altar. So the last slide I have on um, this topic of, of <clears throat> significant elements and symbolism. Again, you'll see another different photograph, different angle of the altar. Um, and a lot of things that I'm talking about here are represented there. Um, so another thing that I learned that I thought was interesting uh, in terms of offerings or gifts for our uh, antepasados um, is that in Mesoamerican cultura, when someone passed and they held those four days of mourning, um, they uh, placed as an offering uh, near wherever it was that the, the viewing was happening, um, the tools, the tools that the person used in life. Um, so for example, most of my uncles are um, construction workers, um, you would place the tools that they used for work with them um, to be buried with them, right? And so I thought that was, again, interesting. And I, I again, made that connection to the ways in which we place the things that um, the, the, our ancestors, our family members used often or ate or liked, right? So uh, for me... I know that I have an uncle who, you know, the coffee Nescafe, the Mexican coffee Nescafe, reminds me of him because he he drank that coffee. The, a perfume, a cologne, uh, sorry, cologne, quorum, reminds me of another uncle. And so I placed that in the altar. The cigarettes, Benson, and Hedges um, that my tia smoked, um, I placed those in the altar. So... Um, when I read about this, right, the tools that, that one used um, in life would be buried with them in Mesoamerican um, times, I thought about like, uh, what would I want in my altar, right? And so one of the, my tools are books and a computer and a laptop and, of course, coffee uh, to do this work. Um, and so those would be my tools. And, and I wondered, wow, like, um, I wonder what my family members would place for me in the altar um, once I'm not here. And it's an interesting thing to think about it that way, right? Um, um, so that's a topic for a longer conversation. Um, but yeah, um, una tecate, a tecate beer for my abuelita who's right up here. Um, so yeah, these are things that um, that we, we place on the altar. There's um, liquor as well, so often mezcal, or tequila is placed in the altar. Um, and down here you'll see a cross on the floor. You also saw it in the altar that was um, 
that of the picture that I took in the Hidalgo, um, salt is uh, to purify um, the space, right? So that's for purification. The cross, to me, it symbolizes Catholicism and religion. Uh, there was another interpretation which uh, uh, read that it symbolized the four directions. So I, I don't know. Um, again, you when you pay attention to all this, there's a mix, right? It's a synchronous synchronism um, of various culturas and practices and ideas. Coming to an end on um, this video on int an introduction uh, to Dia de los Muertos, and I wanted to end by um, talking a little bit about why I feel it's important to keep this tradition alive, to transmit this practice, uh, um, this tradition to our children, um, and continue to do so, right, um, for years to come. So um, I really uh, wanted to express it in the best way possible. And what I, what I think about is that, you know, Culture um, and language, which is a part of culture, these are uh, cultural assets, right? It's cultural capital. Um, oftentimes, especially living living in a society that's um, white supremacist, and I would argue that Mexico is white supremacist, right? It was colonized, um, and that growing up in a country like that. It's easy to internalize ideas that your ways, that your cultura is not valuable, right? But what I'm he saying here is that our cultura is valuable, right? Um, it's a, it's a ca it's capital, it's an asset, and that with the loss of cultural practices and traditions and conocimientos, uh, with the loss of language, we lose knowledge, we lose insight, we lose wisdom. And that's sad, right? So um, uh, that's one reason why learning about our, our history, learning about about our cultura, provides us a, a world view that's more complex, that's more deep, that's deeper, right? Um, that is the gift that comes with being multicultural, multilingual, is that you have different ways of understanding your experience, the world, that someone else that's monolingual, monocultural does not, right? And that's great. Um, it provides you wisdom, right? Access to wisdom um, that's immensely valuable uh, and unique, right? So just ways of doing things, ways of living our lives, ways of knowing um, would be lost if we lost cultura. Um, so that's one reason. Um, and I'll give you maybe two examples, right, of the, the insight or the, the wisdom that our cultura can provide us. One, um, and you can see this very evident in uh, the tradition of Dia de los Muertos. In the tradition of Dia de los Muertos, community is valued and placed at the center. Family is placed at the center. Collectivism is placed at the center versus as opposed to individualism, which is which is a, a, a value in the West. Right? Uh, and so um, that is one asset, but one one um, valuable piece of cultural tradition that we have. Another one is um, the tradition of spirituality, right? Um, of sacrifice versus individualism versus being very self-centered and individualistic, which is something that I would argue is very much uh, prevalent in U.S. American society, dominant culture, dominant culture in the United States. Uh, but that is, again, like that's something that that um, Dia de los Muertos goes against, right? Um, in Dia, through Dia, uh, Dia de los Muertos, Dia de Muertos, we celebrate spirituality, we ce celebrate sacrifice. 
Um, that is part of our cultura. And um, I don't know about you, but myself, going through the U.S. education system, I learned that family was something that held you back. <laughs> that, that held you back, especially as a woman. That you had to let that go and think about yourself, right? Um, in order to, to progress. So, so let that you know, just sink for a little bit. Um, and so that's uh, what uh, cultural uh, insight you know, offers. Um, another reason why um, we would want to like continue to practice this tradition is um, resistance and decolonization, right? So not assimilating into the dominant white paradigm, the dominant white uh, way of doing things, viewing things. Um, and I just gave you two examples. And that strips us from our personal power and wisdom <clears throat> that our ancestors inherited us. Uh, we're honoring and celebrating our, you know, my tío Urbano, who's right here, and my tío Nando, who's right here. What did they teach me? What did they leave behind? What are their legacies? There's, there's so much, right? And, and, and that day, I take the time to connect with that, connect with them, right? And, and revisit what they taught me. Right, I remember one of the, the last things that my uncle said before he passed. Um, he said, "Mija, don't work so much." <laughs> and I haven't, I haven't uh, really listened to that, but uh, you know that is. Think about the power of that, right? Um, so, you know, again, resisting and, and decolonization, staying true to our roots, staying true to who we are, because it's valuable. Um, and again, uh, you know, self-empowerment, again, staying rooted, staying grounded, staying connected, resilience. How do we withstand thriving or moving in a society that's, that's so difficult sometimes to, to move through? we got to tap into that power, right? And so that's an, another reason why. So the, the, the very last thing that I want to talk about um, real quick is I, I need to, because again, I'm a sociologist and, um, and I, this came to my mind, right? So um, the platica, the discussion about appreciation versus appropriation, right? We know that um, you know, Dia de los Muertos has become very popular in the United States. Um, you, you see people you know, painting their faces in November, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's a celebration everywhere, which is good and um, could also feel problematic for some, right? And so I want to talk about that just a little bit. Uh, when uh, thinking about this topic and, and doing this work, um, there were two, two uh, texts that came to my mind. Um, one was an article that I read a while back um, that was, that's titled, uh, I see dead white people. And it talked about, uh, this topic, the subject of cultural appropriation, um, of the, the popularity that Dia de los Muertos was gaining and how, uh, people that did not belong to, to, that did not under, fully understand or were a part of the Mexican, um, community were beginning to, um, celebrate it uh and and how do, do people interpret that right and so there's this question of again white appropriation um and then power dynamics right within um a society and a culture that's dominantly uh white european and what does it mean when um dia de los muertos is uh, uh celebrated in a way that could feel or be disrespectful to um the community that um, whose uh, um, uh, practice, cultural practice that belongs to, right? Um, and so that's uh, worth I think just thinking about. Um, and and then the other uh, book or text that came to my mind was a book uh, titled "Homegrown: Engaged Cultural Criticism" by Bell Hooks and Amelia Mesa Bynes. I misspelled Bynes. It's a B instead of G. Um, and, and they talked again ab about, um, you know, the, 
commodification of cultura, of culture, um, for the for the service of capitalism. So uh, the idea of privatizing um, culture, right? So we have the privatization of water, the privatization of um, land, the privatization of this and that, but also cultura, also the privatization of culture. And this would include Dia de los Muertos, right? So capitalism, uh, one of the things that they say is capitalism demands that everything is accessible and available to all consumers. Um, so, you know, is Dia de los Muertos something to be consumed um, for fun? Or is it something to be understood, learned about, and, and celebrated with responsibility, right? Um, that's my question to you. And, and the other thing... Um, uh, so, so the thing about privatization is that it can lead to superficial multiculturalism, right? So we talk a lot about celebrating difference and multiculturalism, but the thing with, um, you know, appropriation or, or privatization is that it can lead to superficial multiculturalism, right? It's, it's not um, serious. It's, it's for fun and for, to make money, um, and, and that's uh, problematic. Um, and then also <clears throat> one of the things that that Bell Hooks uh, shared is that once you take, once you have corporate um, power take over street culture, um, it no longer um, it is no longer the property of the young uh, black Latinos, etc. Right? It's taken away uh, and reinterpreted or used for private purposes. Um, and so I thought that was important to, to talk about here. Um, and, and so, uh, the other thing that I wanted to, uh, to share is this other, um, quote, right? Corporate mentality finds radical material to co uh, and co-ops it, uh, which translates into consumer based and not politically based multiculturalism. Um, so the difference between appropriation and appreciation. I think appreciation, right, is learning the history through reliable sources, not social media. Um, learning about the history, learning about the origins of a cultural practice. Um, and being in, in practicing it in a responsible way. In, in a um, selfless way, um, not in a disrespectful way. Um, appropriation is taking something for your personal benefit, right? Whether it's financial or your fun, and without considering um, the people who's you, who you're taking from. Um, so, wanted to end with that. Um, again, thank you for watching the video. Um, I hope you learned something. Feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my uh, contact information is here. Um, again, my name is Alicia Lopez, um, Chicana, Chicano Studies, Sociology Instructor at Miracosta College. Feel free to reach out whenever you want. If you have any questions, um, these are my references. Um, and thank you so much.